The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 10, Side 2. Since every taxpayer sought to evade taxes, the state organized a special force of revenue police to examine every man's property and income. Torture was used upon wives, children, and slaves to make them reveal the hidden wealth or earnings of the household, and severe penalties were enacted for evasion. Towards the end of the third century, and still more in the fourth, flight from taxes became almost epidemic in the empire. The well-to-do concealed their riches, local aristocrats had themselves reclassified as humiliores to escape election to municipal office, artisans deserted their trades, peasant proprietors left their overtaxed holdings to become hired men, many villages and some towns, for example Tiberius in Palestine, were abandoned because of high assessments. At last, in the fourth century, thousands of citizens fled over the border to seek refuge among the barbarians. It was probably to check this costly mobility, to ensure a proper flow of food to armies and cities and of taxes to the state, that Diocletian resorted to measures that in effect established serfdom in fields, factories, and guilds. Having made the landowner responsible through tax quotas in kind for the productivity of his tenants, the government ruled that a tenant must remain on his land till his arrears of debt or tithes should be paid. We do not know the date of this historic decree, but in 332 a law of Constantine assumed and confirmed it, and made the tenant adscriptitious, bound in writing to the soil he tilled. He could not leave it without the consent of the owner, and when it was sold he and his household were sold with it. He made no protest that has come down to us, perhaps the law was presented to him as a guarantee of security, as in Germany today. In this and other ways agriculture passed in the third century from slavery, through freedom, to serfdom, and entered the Middle Ages. Similar means of compelling stability were used in industry. Labor was frozen to its job, forbidden to pass from one shop to another without governmental consent. Each collegium or guild was bound to its trade and its assigned task, and no man might leave the guild in which he had been enrolled. Membership in one guild or another was made compulsory on all persons engaged in commerce and industry, and the son was required to follow the trade of his father. When any man wished to leave his place or occupation for another, the state reminded him that Italy was in a state of siege by the barbarians, and that every man must stay at his post. In the year 305, in impressive ceremonies at Nicomedia and Milan, Diocletian and Maximian abdicated their power, and Galerius and Constantius Chlorus became Augusti, emperors respectively of the East and the West. Diocletian, still but fifty-five years of age, lost himself in his immense palace at Spalato, spent there the remaining eight years of his life, and saw without interference the breakdown of his tetrarchy and civil war. When Maximian urged him to return to power and end the strife, he replied that if Maximian could see the excellent cabbages he was growing in his garden, he would not ask him to sacrifice such content for the pursuit and cares of power. He deserved his cabbages and his rest. He had ended a half-century of anarchy, had re-established government and law, had restored stability to industry and security to trade, had tamed Persia and stilled the barbarians, and despite a few murders, had been, all in all, a sincere legislator and a just judge. It is true that he had established an expensive bureaucracy, had ended local autonomy, had punished opposition harshly, had persecuted the church that might have been a helpful ally in his healing work, and had turned the population of the empire into a caste society with an unlettered peasantry at one end and an absolute monarch at the other. But the conditions that Rome faced would not permit liberal policies. Marcus Aurelius and Alexander Severus had tried these and failed. Confronted by enemies on every side, the Roman state did what all nations must do in crucial wars. It accepted the dictatorship of a strong leader, taxed itself beyond tolerance, and put individual liberty aside until collective liberty was secured. Diocletian had, with more cost but under harder circumstances, repeated the achievement of Augustus. His contemporaries and his posterity, mindful of what they had escaped, called him the father of the Golden Age. Constantine entered the house that Diocletian built. Chapter 30 The Last Chapter The Triumph of Christianity, A.D. 306-325 1. The War of Church and State A.D. 64-311 In pre-Christian days the Roman government had for the most part allowed to the rivals of Orthodox paganism a tolerance which they in turn had showed to the official and imperial cults. Nothing was demanded from the adherents of new faiths except an occasional gesture of adoration to the gods and head of the state. The emperors were piqued to find that of all the heretics under their rule, only the Christians and the Jews refused to join in honoring their genius. The burning of incense before a statue of the emperor had become a sign and affirmation of loyalty to the empire, like the oath of allegiance required for citizenship today. On its side, the church resented the Roman idea that religion was subordinate to the state. 
It saw in emperor worship an act of polytheism and idolatry, and instructed its followers to refuse it at any cost. The Roman government concluded that Christianity was a radical, perhaps a communist movement, subtly designed to overthrow the established order. Before Nero, the two forces had found it possible to live together without blows. The law had exempted the Jews from emperor worship, and the Christians, at first confused with the Jews, were granted the same privilege. But the execution of Peter and Paul, and the burning of Christians to light up Nero's games, turned this mutual and contemptuous tolerance into unceasing hostility and intermittent war. We cannot wonder that after such provocation the Christians turned their full armory against Rome, denounced its immorality and idolatry, ridiculed its gods, rejoiced in its calamities, and predicted its early fall. In the ardor of a faith made intolerant by intolerance, Christians declared that all who had had a chance to accept Christ and had refused would be condemned to eternal torments. Many of them foretold the same fate for all the pre-Christian or non-Christian world. Some accepted Socrates. In reply, pagans called the Christians dregs of the people and insolent barbarians, accused them of hatred of the human race, and described the misfortunes of the empire to the anger of pagan deities whose Christian revilers had been allowed to live. A thousand slanderous legends arose on either side. Christians were charged with demonic magic, secret immorality, drinking human blood at the Paschal Feast, and worshipping an ass. But the conflict was profounder than mere pugnacity. Pagan civilization was founded upon the state, Christian civilization upon religion. To a Roman, his religion was part of the structure and ceremony of government, and his morality culminated in patriotism. To a Christian, his religion was something apart from and superior to political society. His highest allegiance belonged not to Caesar but to Christ. Tertullian laid down the revolutionary principle that no man need obey a law that he deemed unjust. The Christian revered his bishop, even his priest, far above the Roman magistrate. He submitted his legal troubles with fellow Christians to his church authorities rather than to the officials of the state. The detachment of the Christian from earthly affairs seemed to the pagan a flight from civic duty, a weakening of the national fiber and will. Tertullian advised Christians to refuse military service, and that a substantial number of them followed his counsel is indicated by Celsus's appeal to end this refusal, and Origen's reply that though Christians will not fight for the empire, they will pray for it. Christians were exhorted by their leaders to avoid non-Christians, to shun their festival games as barbarous, and their theaters as stews of obscenity. Marriage with a non-Christian was forbidden. Christian slaves were accused of introducing discord into the family by converting their masters, children, or wives. Christianity was charged with breaking up the home. The opposition to the new religion came rather from the people than from the state. The magistrates were often men of culture and tolerance, but the mass of the pagan population resented the aloofness, superiority, and certainty of the Christians, and called upon the authorities to punish these atheists for insulting the gods. Tertullian notes the general hatred felt for us. From the time of Nero, Roman law seems to have branded the profession of Christianity as a capital offense but under most of the emperors this ordinance was enforced with deliberate negligence. If accused, a Christian could usually free himself by offering incense to a statue of the emperor. Thereafter, he was apparently allowed to resume the quiet practice of his faith. Christians who refused this obeisance might be imprisoned or flogged or exiled or condemned to the mines or rarely put to death. Domitian seems to have banished some Christians from Rome, but being in some degree human, says Tertullian, he soon stopped what he had begun and restored the exiles. Pliny enforced the law with the officiousness of an amateur in 111, if we may judge from his letter to Trajan. The method I have observed toward those who have been denounced to me as Christians is this. I interrogate them whether they were Christians. If they confess it, I repeated the question twice again, adding the threat of capital punishment. If they still persevered, I ordered them to be executed. The temples, which had been almost deserted, begin now to be frequented, and there is a general demand for sacrificial animals, which for some time past have met with but few purchasers. To which Trajan replied, The method you have pursued, my dear Pliny, in sifting the cases of those denounced to you as Christians is eminently proper. No search should be made for these people. When they are denounced and found guilty, they must be punished. But where the accused party denies that he is a Christian and gives proof by adoring our gods, he shall be pardoned. Information without the accuser's name subscribed must not be admitted in evidence against anyone. The passage here italicized, No search should be made for these people suggests that Trajan only reluctantly carried out a pre-existing statute. Nevertheless, we hear of two prominent martyrs in his principate, Simeon, head of the Church of Jerusalem, and Ignatius, bishop of Antioch. Presumably, there were others of less fame. Hadrian, a skeptic open to all ideas, instructed his appointees to give the Christians the benefit of every doubt. Being more religious, Antoninus allowed more persecution. 
At Smyrna, the populace demanded of the Asiarch Philip that he enforce the law. He complied by having eleven Christians executed in the amphitheater in 155. The bloodthirst of the crowd was aroused rather than assuaged. It clamored for the death of Bishop Polycarp, saintly patriarch of eighty-six years, who is said in his youth to have known St. John. Roman soldiers found the old man in a suburban retreat and brought him unresisting before the Asiarch at the games. Philip pressed him. Take the oath, revile Christ, and I will let you go. Polycarp, says the most ancient of the acts of the martyrs, replied, For eighty-six years I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The crowd burnt out that he should be burned alive. The flames, says the pious document, refused to burn him, but he was within them as bread that is being baked, and we perceived such a fragrant smell as might come from incense or other costly spices. At length the lawless men commanded an executioner to stab him. When he did this there came out a dove, and so much blood that the fire was quenched, and all the crowd marveled. The persecutions were renewed under the saintly Aurelius. When famine, flood, pestilence, and war overwhelmed a once happy reign, the conviction spread that these evils were due to neglect and denial of the Roman gods. Aurelius shared the public terror, or yielded to it. In 177 he issued a rescript ordering the punishment of sects that caused disturbances by exciting the ill-balanced minds of men with new winds of doctrine. In that same year, at Vienne and Lyon, the pagan populace arose in fury against the Christians and stoned them whenever they dared to stir from their homes the imperial legate ordered the arrest of the leading Christians of Lyon. Bishop Pothinus, ninety years old, died in jail from the effects of torture. A messenger was sent to Rome to ask the advice of the emperor as to the treatment of the remaining prisoners. Marcus replied that those who denied Christianity should be freed, but those who professed it should be put to death according to the law. The annual festival of the Augustalia was now to be celebrated in Lyon, and delegates from all Gaul crowded the provincial capital. At the height of the games, the accused Christians were brought to the amphitheater and were questioned. Those who recanted were dismissed. Forty-seven who persisted were put to death with a variety and barbarity of tortures equaled only by the Inquisition. Attalus, second to Pothinus in the Christian community, was forced to sit on a chair of red-hot iron and rose to death. Blandina, a slave girl, was tortured all day, then bound up in a bag and thrown into the arena to be gored to death by a bull. Her silent fortitude led many Christians to believe that Christ made his martyrs insensitive to pain. The same result might have come from ecstasy and fear. The Christian, said Tertullian, even when condemned to die, gives thanks. Under Commodus the persecutions waned. Septimius Severus renewed them, even to the point of making baptism a crime. In 203 many Christians suffered martyrdom in Carthage. One of them, a young mother named Perpetua, left a touching account of her days in prison and her father's prostrate pleas that she should renounce Christianity. She and another young mother were tossed and gored by a bull, we have an indication of the anesthetic effect of fear and trance in her later query, When are we to be tossed? Story tells how she guided to her throat the dagger of the reluctant gladiator who had to kill her. The Syrian empresses who followed Septimius had little concern for the Roman gods and gave Christianity a careless toleration. Under Alexander Severus, peace seemed established among all the rival faiths. The renewal of the barbarian attacks ended this truce. To understand the persecution under Decius or Aurelius, we must imagine a nation in the full excitement of war, frightened by serious defeats, and expecting hostile invasion. In 249 a wave of religious emotion swept the empire. Men and women flocked to the temples and besieged the gods with prayers. Amid this fever of patriotism and fear, the Christians stood apart, still resenting and discouraging military service, scorning the gods and interpreting the collapse of the empire as the prophesied prelude to the destruction of Babylon and the return of Christ. Using the mood of the people as an opportunity to strengthen national enthusiasm and unity, Decius issued an edict requiring every inhabitant of the realm to offer a propitiatory act of homage to the gods of Rome. Apparently Christians were not asked to abjure their own faith, but were commanded to join in the universal supplicatio to the deities who, the populace believed, had so often saved imperiled Rome. Most Christians complied. In Alexandria, according to its bishop Dionysius, the apostasy was universal. It was likewise in Carthage and Smyrna. Probably these Christians considered the supplicatio a patriotic formality. But the bishops of Jerusalem and Antioch died in jail, and the bishops of Rome and Toulouse were put to death, this in 250. Hundreds of Roman Christians were crowded into dungeons. Some were beheaded, some were burned at the stake, a few were given to the beasts in holiday festival. After a year the persecution abated, and by Easter of 251 it was practically at an end. Six years later, Valerian, in another crisis of invasion and terror, ordered that all persons must conform to the Roman ceremonials, 
and forbade any Christian assemblage. Pope Sixtus II resisted and was put to death with four of his deacons. Bishop Cyprian of Carthage was beheaded. The Bishop of Tarragona was burned alive. In 261, after the Persians had removed Valerian from the scene, Galienus published the first Edict of Toleration, recognizing Christianity as a permitted religion, and ordering that property taken from Christians should be restored to them. Minor persecutions occurred in the next forty years, but for the most part these were for Christianity, decades of unprecedented calm and rapid growth. In the chaos and terror of the third century, men fled from the weakened state to the consolations of religion and found them more abundantly in Christianity than in its rivals. The church made rich converts now, built costly cathedrals, and allowed its adherents to share in the joys of this world. The odium theologicum subsided among the people. Christians intermingled more freely with pagans, even married them. The oriental monarchy of Diocletian seemed destined to consolidate religious as well as political security and peace. Galerius, however, saw in Christianity the last obstacle to absolute rule, and urged his chief to complete the Roman restoration by restoring the Roman gods. Diocletian hesitated. He was averse to needless risks and estimated more truly than Galerius the magnitude of the task. But one day, at an imperial sacrifice, the Christians made the sign of the cross to ward off evil demons. When the augurs failed to find on the livers of the sacrificed animals the marks that they had hoped to interpret, they blamed the presence of profane and unbelieving persons. Diocletian ordered that all in attendance should offer sacrifice to the gods or be flogged, and that all soldiers in the army should similarly conform or be dismissed. This in 302. Strange to say, Christian writers agreed with the pagan priests. The prayers of the Christian, said Lactantius, kept the Roman gods at a distance, and Bishop Dionysius had written to the same effect a generation before. Galerius at every opportunity argued the need of religious unity as a support to the new monarchy. And at last, Diocletian yielded. In February 303, the four rulers decreed the destruction of all Christian churches, the burning of Christian books, the dissolution of Christian congregations, the confiscation of their property, the exclusion of Christians from public office, and the punishment of death for Christians detected in religious assembly. A band of soldiers inaugurated the persecution by burning to the ground the cathedral at Nicomedia. The Christians were now numerous enough to retaliate. A revolutionary movement broke out in Syria, and in Nicomedia, incendiaries twice set fire to Diocletian's palace. Galerius accused the Christians of the arson, they accused him— Hundreds of Christians were arrested and tortured, but the guilt was never fixed. In September, Diocletian ordered that imprisoned Christians who would worship the Roman gods should be freed, but that those who refused should be subjected to every torture known to Rome. Infuriated by scornful resistance, he directed all provincial magistrates to seek out every Christian and use any method to compel him to appease the gods. Then, probably glad to leave this miserable enterprise to his successors, he resigned. Maximian carried out the edict with military thoroughness in Italy. Galerius, become Augustus, gave every encouragement to the persecution in the East. The role of martyrs was increased in every part of the empire except Gaul and Britain, where Constantius contented himself with burning a few churches. Eusebius assures us, presumably with the hyperbole of indignation, that men were flogged till the flesh hung from their bones, or their flesh was scraped to the bone with shells. Salt or vinegar was poured upon the wounds, the flesh was cut off bit by bit and fed to waiting animals, or, bound to crosses, men were eaten piecemeal by starved beasts. Some victims had their fingers pierced with sharp reeds under the nails, some had their eyes gouged out, some were suspended by a hand or a foot, some had molten lead poured down their throats, some were beheaded or crucified or beaten to death with clubs, some were torn apart by being tied to the momentarily bent branches of trees. We have no pagan narrative of these events. The persecution continued for eight years and brought death to approximately 1,500 Christians, orthodox or heretic, and diverse sufferings to countless more. Thousands of Christians recanted. Tradition said that even Marcellinus, bishop of Rome, denied his faith under duress of terror and pain. But most of the persecuted stood firm, and the sight or report of heroic fidelity under torture strengthened the faith of the wavering and won new members for the hunted congregations. As the brutalities multiplied, the sympathy of the pagan population was stirred. The opinion of good citizens found courage to express itself against the most ferocious oppression in Roman history. Once the people had urged the state to destroy Christianity, now the people stood aloof from the government, and many pagans risked death to hide or protect Christians until the storm should pass. In 311, Galerius, suffering from a mortal illness, convinced of failure, and implored by his wife to make his peace with the undefeated god of the Christians, 
promulgated an edict of toleration, recognizing Christianity as a lawful religion and asking the prayers of the Christians in return for our most gentle clemency. The Diocletian persecution was the greatest test and triumph of the Church. It weakened Christianity for a time through the natural defection of adherents who had joined it or grown up during a half-century of unmolested prosperity. But soon the defaulters were doing penance and pleading for readmission to the fold. Accounts of the loyalty of martyrs who had died or of confessors who had suffered for the faith were circulated from community to community, and these Acta Martyrum, intense with exaggeration and fascinating with legend, played a historic role in awakening or confirming Christian belief. The blood of martyrs, said Tertullian, is seed. There is no greater drama in human record than the sight of a few Christians, scorned or oppressed by a succession of emperors, bearing all trials with a fierce tenacity, multiplying quietly, building order while their enemies generated chaos, fighting the sword with the word, brutality with hope, and at last defeating the strongest state that history has known. Caesar and Christ had met in the arena, and Christ had won. 2. The Rise of Constantine Diocletian, peaceful in his Dalmatian palace, saw the failure of both the persecution and the tetrarchy. Seldom in the empire witnessed such confusion as followed his abdication. Galerius prevailed upon Constantius to let him appoint Severus and Maximinus Deza as Caesars, this in 305. At once the principle of heredity asserted its claims. Maxentius, son of Maximian, wished to succeed his father's authority, and a like resolution fired Constantine. Flavius Valerius Constantinus had begun life at Naissus in Mesia, possibly in 272, as the illegitimate son of Constantius by his legal concubine Helena, a barmaid from Bithynia. On becoming a Caesar, Constantius was required by Diocletian to put away Helena and to take Maximian's stepdaughter Theodora as his wife. Constantine received only a meager education. He took up soldiering early and proved his valor in the wars against Egypt and Persia. Galerius, on succeeding Diocletian, kept the young officer near him as a hostage for the good behavior of Constantius. When the latter asked Galerius to send the youth to him, Galerius procrastinated craftily, but Constantine escaped from his watchers and rode night and day across Europe to join his father at Boulogne and share in a British campaign. The Gallic army, deeply loyal to the humane Constantius, came to love his handsome, brave, and energetic son. And when the father died at York in 306, the troops acclaimed Constantine not merely as Caesar, but as Augustus, emperor. He accepted the lesser title, excusing himself on the ground that his life would be unsafe without an army at his back. Galerius, too distant to intervene, reluctantly recognized him as a Caesar. Constantine fought successfully against the invading Franks and fed the beasts of the Gallic amphitheaters with barbarian kings. Meanwhile in Rome, the Praetorian Guard, eager to restore the ancient capital to leadership, hailed Maxentius as emperor, this in 306. Severus descended from Milan to attack him. Maximian, to confound the confusion, returned to the purple at his son's request and joined in the campaign. Severus was deserted by his troops and put to death in 307. To help him face the growing chaos, the aging Galerius appointed a new Augustus, Flavius Licinius, hearing which Constantine assumed a like dignity in 307. A year later, Maximinus Deza adopted the same title, so that in place of the two Augusti of Diocletian's plan, there were now six. No one cared to be merely Caesar. Maxentius quarreled with his father. Maximian went to Gaul to seek Constantine's aid. While the latter fought Germans on the Rhine, Maximian tried to replace him as commander of the Gallic armies. Constantine marched across Gaul, besieged the usurper in Marseille, captured him, and granted him the courtesy of suicide in 310. The death of Galerius in 311 removed the last barrier between intrigue and war. Maximinus plotted with Maxentius to overthrow Licinius and Constantine, who conspired to overthrow them. Taking the initiative, Constantine crossed the Alps, defeated an army near Turin, and advanced upon Rome with a celerity of movement and a restraining discipline of his troops that recalled the march of Caesar from the Rubicon. On October 27, 312, he met the forces of Maxentius at Saxa Rubra, or Red Rocks, nine miles north of Rome and by superior strategy compelled Maxentius to fight with his back to the Tiber, and no retreat possible except over the Mulvian Bridge. On the afternoon before the battle, says Eusebius, Constantine saw a flaming cross in the sky with the Greek words, Antutoi Nika, in this sign conquer. Early the next morning, according to Eusebius and Lactantius, Constantine dreamed that a voice commanded him to have his soldiers mark upon their shields the letter X with a line drawn through it and curled around the top, the symbol of Christ. On arising he obeyed and then advanced into the forefront of battle behind a standard, known henceforth as the Labarum, carrying the initials of Christ interwoven with a cross. 
As Maxentius displayed the Mithraic Aurelian banner of the unconquerable sun, Constantine cast in his lot with the Christians, who were numerous in his army, and made the engagement a turning point in the history of religion. To the worshippers of Mithras in Constantine's forces, the cross could give no offense, for they had long fought under a standard bearing a Mithraic cross of light. In any case, Constantine won the Battle of the Mulvian Bridge, and Maxentius perished in the Tiber with thousands of his troops. The victor entered Rome and welcomed the undisputed master of the West. Early in 313, Constantine and Licinius met at Milan to coordinate their rule. To consolidate Christian support in all provinces, Constantine and Licinius issued an Edict of Milan, confirming the religious toleration proclaimed by Galerius, extending it to all religions, and ordering the restoration of Christian properties seized during the recent persecutions. After this historic declaration, which in effect conceded the defeat of paganism, Constantine returned to the defense of Gaul, and Licinius moved eastward to overwhelm Maximinus, this in 313. The death of Maximinus shortly afterward left Constantine and Licinius the unchallenged rulers of the empire. Licinius married Constantine's sister, and a war-weary people rejoiced at the prospect of peace. But neither of the Augusti had quite abandoned the hope of undivided supremacy. In 314 their mounting enmity reached the point of war. Constantine invaded Pannonia, defeated Licinius, and exacted the surrender of all Roman Europe except Thrace. Licinius revenged himself upon Constantine's Christian supporters by renewing the persecution in Asia and Egypt. He excluded Christians from his palace at Nicomedia, required every soldier to adore the pagan gods, forbade the simultaneous attendance of both sexes at Christian worship, and at last prohibited all Christian services within city walls. Disobedient Christians lost their positions, their citizenship, their property, their liberty, or their lives. Constantine watched for an opportunity not only to succor the Christians of the East, but to add the East to his realm. When barbarians invaded Thrace and Licinius failed to move against them, Constantine led his army from Thessalonica to the rescue of Licinius's province. After the barbarians were driven back, Licinius protested Constantine's entry into Thrace, and as neither ruler desired peace, war was renewed. The defender of Christianity, with 130,000 men, met the defender of paganism, with 160,000 men, first at Adrianople and then at Chrysopolis, now Scutari, and won and became sole emperor in 323. Licinius surrendered on a promise of pardon, but in the following year he was executed on the charge that he had resumed his intrigues. Constantine recalled the Christian exiles and restored to all confessors their lost privileges and property. While still proclaiming liberty of worship for all, he now definitely declared himself a Christian and invited his subjects to join him in embracing the new faith. 3. Constantine and Christianity Was this conversion sincere? Was it an act of religious belief or a consummate stroke of political wisdom? Probably the latter. His mother Helena had turned to Christianity when Constantius divorced her. Presumably she had acquainted her son with the excellences of the Christian way, and doubtless he had been impressed by the invariable victory that had crowned his arms under the banner and cross of Christ. But only a skeptic would have made so subtle a use of the religious feelings of humanity. The Historia Augusta quotes him as saying, It is Fortuna that makes a man emperor. Though this was a bow to modesty rather than to chance. In his Gallic court he had surrounded himself with pagan scholars and philosophers. After his conversion he seldom conformed to the ceremonial requirements of Christian worship. His letters to Christian bishops made it clear that he cared little for the theological differences that agitated Christendom, though he was willing to suppress dissent in the interests of imperial unity. Throughout his reign he treated the bishops as his political aides, he summoned them, presided over their councils, and agreed to enforce whatever opinion their majority should formulate. A real believer would have been a Christian first and a statesman afterward. With Constantine it was the reverse. Christianity was to him a means, not an end. He had seen in his lifetime the failure of three persecutions, and it was not lost upon him that Christianity had grown despite them. Its adherents were still very much in the minority, but they were relatively united, brave, and strong, while the pagan majority was divided among many creeds, and included a dead weight of simple souls without conviction or influence. Christians were especially numerous in Rome under Maxentius, and in the East under Licinius. Constantine's support of Christianity was worth a dozen legions to him in his wars against these men. He was impressed by the comparative order and morality of Christian conduct, the bloodless beauty of Christian ritual, the obedience of Christians to their clergy, their humble acceptance of life's inequalities in the hope of happiness beyond the grave. Perhaps this new religion would purify Roman morals, regenerate marriage and the family, and allay the fever of class war. The Christians, despite bitter oppression, had rarely revolted against the state. 
Their teachers had inculcated submission to the civil powers and had taught the divine right of kings. Constantine aspired to an absolute monarchy. Such a government would profit from religious support. The hierarchical discipline and ecumenical authority of the church seemed to offer a spiritual correlate for monarchy. Perhaps that marvelous organization of bishops and priests could become an instrument of pacification, unification, and rule. Nevertheless, in a world still preponderantly pagan, Constantine had to feel his way by cautious steps. He continued to use vague monotheistic language that any pagan could accept. During the earlier years of his supremacy, he carried out patiently the ceremonial required of them as Pontifex Maximus of the traditional cult. He restored pagan temples and ordered the taking of the auspices. He used pagan as well as Christian rites in dedicating Constantinople. He used pagan magic formulas to protect crops and heal disease. Gradually, as his power grew more secure, he favored Christianity more openly. After 311, his coins dropped one by one their pagan effigies until by 323 they bore only neutral inscriptions. A legal text of his reign, questioned but not disproved, gave Christian bishops the authority of judges in their dioceses. Other laws exempted church realty from taxation, made Christian associations juridical persons, allowed them to own land and receive bequests, and assigned the property of intestate martyrs to the church. Constantine gave money to needy congregations, built several churches in Constantinople and elsewhere, and forbade the worship of images in the new capital. Forgetting the Edict of Milan, he prohibited the meetings of heretical sects and finally ordered the destruction of their conventicles. He gave his sons an orthodox Christian education and financed his mother's Christian philanthropies. The church rejoiced in blessings beyond any expectation. Eusebius broke out into orations that were songs of gratitude and praise— and all over the empire Christians gathered in festal thanksgiving for the triumph of their god. Three clouds softened the brilliance of this cloudless day, the monastic secession, the Donatist schism, the Arian heresy. In the interval between the Decian and the Diocletian persecution, the church had become the richest religious organization in the empire and had moderated its attacks upon wealth. Cyprian complained that his parishioners were mad about money, that Christian women painted their faces, that bishops held lucrative offices of state, made fortunes, lent money at usurious interest, and denied their faith at the first sign of danger. Eusebius mourned that priests quarreled violently in their competition for ecclesiastical preferment. While Christianity converted the world, the world converted Christianity and displayed the natural paganism of mankind. Christian monasticism arose as a protest against this mutual adjustment of the spirit and the flesh. A minority wished to avoid any indulgence of human appetite and to continue the early Christian absorption in thoughts of eternal life. Following the custom of the cynics, some of these ascetics renounced all possessions, donned the ragged robe of the philosopher, and subsisted on alms. A few, like Paul the Hermit, went to live as solitaries in the Egyptian desert. About 275, an Egyptian monk, Anthony, began a quarter century of isolated existence, first in a tomb, then in an abandoned mountain castle, then in a rock-hewn desert cell. There he struggled nightly with frightful visions and pleasant dreams, and overcame them all, until at last his reputation for sanctity filled all Christendom and peopled the desert with emulating Eremites. In 325, Pacomius, feeling that solitude was selfishness, gathered anchorites into an abbey at Teben in Egypt and founded that cenobitic or community monasticism which was to have its most influential development in the West. The Church opposed the monastic movement for a time and then accepted it as a necessary balance to its increasing preoccupation with government. Within a year after Constantine's conversion, the Church was torn by a schism that might have ruined it in the very hour of victory. Donatus, Bishop of Carthage, supported by a priest of like name and temper, insisted that Christian bishops who had surrendered the scriptures to the pagan police during the persecutions had forfeited their office and powers, that baptisms or ordinations performed by such bishops were null and void, and that the validity of sacraments depended in part upon the spiritual state of the ministrant. When the Church refused to adopt this stringent creed, the Donatists set up rival bishops wherever the existing prelate failed to meet their tests. Constantine, who had thought of Christianity as a unifying force, was dismayed by the chaos and violence that ensued, and was presumably not unmoved by the occasional alliance of Donatists with radical movements among the African peasantry. He called a council of bishops at Arles in 314, confirmed its denunciation of the Donatists, ordered the schismatics to return to the church, and decreed that recalcitrant congregations should lose their property and their civil rights in 316. Five years later, in a momentary reminiscence of the Milan Edict, he withdrew these measures and gave the Donatists a scornful toleration. 
The schism continued till the Saracens overwhelmed Orthodox and heretic alike in the conquest of Africa. In those same years, Alexandria saw the rise of the most challenging heresy in the history of the Church. About 318, a priest from the Egyptian town of Baucalus startled his bishop with strange opinions about the nature of Christ. A learned Catholic historian describes him generously. Arius was tall and thin, of melancholy look, and an aspect that showed traces of his austerities. He was known to be an ascetic, as could be seen from his costume, a short tunic without sleeves under a scarf that served as a cloak. His manner of speaking was gentle, his addresses were persuasive. The consecrated virgins, who were numerous in Alexandria, held him in great esteem, and he counted many staunch supporters among the higher clergy. Christ, said Arius, was not one with the Creator, he was rather the Logos, the first and highest of all created beings. Bishop Alexander protested, Arius persisted. If, he argued, the Son had been begotten of the Father, it must have been in time. The Son, therefore, could not be co-eternal with the Father. Furthermore, if Christ was created, it must have been from nothing, not from the Father's substance. Christ was not consubstantial with the Father. The Holy Spirit was begotten by the Logos and was still less God than the Logos. We see in these doctrines the continuity of ideas from Plato through the Stoics, Philo, Plotinus, and Origen to Arius. Platonism, which had so deeply influenced Christian theology, was now in conflict with the Church. Bishop Alexander was shocked not only by these views, but by their rapid spread even among the clergy. He called a council of Egyptian bishops at Alexandria, persuaded it to unfrock Arius and his followers, and sent an account of the proceedings to other bishops. Some of these objected, many priests sympathized with Arius. Throughout the Asiatic provinces, clergy as well as laity divided on the issue and made the cities ring with such tumult and disorder that the Christian religion, says Eusebius, afforded a subject of profane merriment to the pagans, even in their theaters. Constantine, coming to Nicomedia after overthrowing Licinius, heard the story from its bishop. He sent both Alexander and Arius a personal appeal to imitate the calm of philosophers, to reconcile their differences peaceably, or at least to keep their debates from the public ear. The letter, preserved by Eusebius, clearly reveals Constantine's lack of theology and the political purpose of his religious policy. I had proposed to lead back to a single form the ideas which all people conceive of the deity, for I feel strongly that if I could induce men to unite on that subject, the conduct of public affairs would be considerably eased. But alas, I hear that there are more disputes among you than recently in Africa. The cause seems to be quite trifling and unworthy of such fierce contests. You, Alexander, wish to know what your priests were thinking on a point of law, even on a portion only of a question in itself entirely devoid of importance. And you, Arius, if you had such thoughts, should have kept silence. There was no need to make these questions public, since they are problems that idleness alone raises, and whose only use is to sharpen men's wits. These are silly actions worthy of inexperienced children, and not of priests or reasonable men. The letter had no effect. To the Church, the question of the consubstantiality, or homoousia, as against the mere similarity, or homoousia, of the Son and the Father, was vital both theologically and politically. If Christ was not God, the whole structure of Christian doctrine would begin to crack. And if division were permitted on this question, chaos of belief might destroy the unity and authority of the Church, and therefore its value as an aid to the state. As the controversy spread, setting the Greek east aflame, Constantine resolved to end it by calling the first ecumenical, or universal, council of the Church. He summoned all bishops to meet in 325 at Bithynian Nicaea, near his capital, Nicomedia, and provided funds for all their expenses. Not less than 318 bishops came, attended, says one of them, by a vast concourse of the lower clergy. The statement reveals the immense growth of the Church. Most of the bishops were from the eastern provinces— Many Western dioceses ignored the controversy, and Pope Sylvester I, detained by illness, was content to be represented by some priests. The council met in the hall of an imperial palace. Constantine presided and opened the proceedings by a brief appeal to the bishops to restore the unity of the Church. He listened patiently to the debates, reports Eusebius, moderated the violence of the contending parties, and himself joined in the argument. Arius reaffirmed his view that Christ was a created being, not equal to the Father, but divine only by participation. Clever questioners forced him to admit that if Christ was a creature and it had a beginning, he could change, and that if he could change, he might pass from virtue to vice. The answers were logical, honest, and suicidal. Athanasius, the eloquent and pugnacious archdeacon whom Alexander had brought with him as a theological sword, made it clear that if Christ and the Holy Spirit were not of one substance with the Father, polytheism would triumph. 
He conceded the difficulty of picturing three distinct persons in one God, but argued that reason must bow to the mystery of the Trinity. All but seventeen of the bishops agreed with him and signed a statement expressing his view. The supporters of Arius agreed to sign if they might add one iota, changing Homo Usian to Homo Usian. The council refused and issued with the emperor's approval the following creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible or invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten, not made, being of one essence, or Homo Usian, with the Father, who for us men and our salvation came down and was made flesh, was made man, suffered, rose again the third day, ascended into heaven, and comes to judge the quick and the dead. Only five bishops, finally only two, refused to sign this formula. These two, with the unrepentant Arius, were anathematized by the council and exiled by the emperor. An imperial edict ordered that all books by Arius should be burned and made the concealment of such a book punishable with death. Constantine celebrated the conclusion of the council with a royal dinner to all the assembled bishops and then dismissed them with the request that they should not tear one another to pieces. He was mistaken in thinking that the controversy was ended, or that he himself would not change his view of it, but he was right in believing that he had struck a great blow for the unity of the church. The council signalized the conviction of the ecclesiastical majority that the organization and survival of the church required a certain fixity of doctrine, and in final effect it achieved that practical unanimity of basic belief which gave the medieval church its Catholic name. At the same time, it marked the replacement of paganism with Christianity as the religious expression and support of the Roman Empire, and committed Constantine to a more definite alliance with Christianity than ever before. A new civilization based on a new religion would now rise over the ruins of an exhausted culture and a dying creed. The Middle Ages had begun. 4. Constantine and Civilization a year after the council, Constantine dedicated, amid the desolation of Byzantium, a new city which he termed Nova Roma, and which posterity called by his name. In 330 he turned his back upon both Rome and Nicomedia and made Constantinople his capital. There he surrounded himself with the impressive pomp of an oriental court, feeling that its psychological influence upon army and people would make its expensive pageantry a subtle economy and government. He protected the army with able diplomacy and arms, tempered despotism with humane decrees, and lent his aid to letters and the arts. He discouraged the schools at Athens and founded at Constantinople a new university where state-paid professors taught Greek and Latin, literature and philosophy, rhetoric and law, and trained officials for the empire. He confirmed and extended the privileges of physicians and teachers in all provinces. Provincial governors were instructed to establish schools of architecture and to draw students to them with divers privileges and rewards. Artists were exempted from civic obligations so that they might have time to learn their art thoroughly and transmit it to their sons. The art treasures of the empire were drawn upon to make Constantinople an elegant capital. In Rome, the architectural works of this period were inaugurated by Maxentius. He began in 306 and Constantine finished an immense basilica that marked the climax of classical architecture in the West. Adapting the structure of the Great Baths, this edifice covered an area 330 by 250 feet. Its central hall, 114 by 82 feet, was roofed by three cross vaults of concrete 120 feet high, partly supported by eight broad piers faced with fluted Corinthian columns 60 feet tall. Its pavement was of colored marble, its bays were peopled with statuary, and the walls of these bays were prolonged above their roofs to serve as elevated buttresses for the central vaults. Gothic and Renaissance architects found much instruction in these vaults and buttresses. This book is continued on Cassette 11, Side 1.